Grace, peace, and mercy be unto you from the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. So this seven-part series about being a disciple of Christ, uh, the first week we talked about Jesus is messing with you. He's messing with everybody, not in a bad way. He's trying to get your attention, trying to get my attention, trying to work his redemptive plan in each and every individual's life. Last week we talked about the river has moved. By that, we understand that our society, our culture, the world itself is not what it used to be. Forty, fifty years ago, you could build a church and people would come. Not that way anymore. A lot of people with doubts. Millions of people who have been brought up in the church have walked away and are no longer wanting anything to do with the church. So this morning, we're going to talk about seeking what's already happening. We talked about the idea that old thoughts and old mindsets get us old results. New thoughts, new mindsets get us new results. We talked about the fact that Jesus' strategy for discipling is effectively inefficient. What was his secret weapon? How did Jesus disciple people? Look at the Gospels. He hung out with people. And this should not be hard for us to do. We all do it, do we not? I can go down to the Eagle several times a day, and I will find people hanging out. I can go to the Cinex station, and I will find people hanging out. I can go to the movie theater. I can go to restaurants. I can go to businesses. I can walk down the street sometimes, and you'll find people just hanging out, being together, conversing. So it's very, very simple. What we're going to talk about this morning is what's already happening. We're seeking what's already happening. We've already heard that Jesus is on the loose. He started back in his ministry three or so years before he was crucified. And he has called game on. He says, I'm at work and he's still at work every single moment of every single day in the lives of every individual that still exists or will exist. And so it's really simple. All he says is you need to hang out with people. We've already talked about that. That's easy. And it's not supposed to be the people you always hang out with necessarily. It should be people you interact with, but not the same group time after time after time. But they are people you're supposedly or hopefully interacting with. Sometimes on a casual, not a routine basis. But you're hanging out with people. And then the next thing we talk to, we're going to talk about is seeking. Seeking the kingdom of God. It's here, it's now. And that's the thing some people don't understand. Some people hear kingdom of God and think about heaven. That little place, not little place, but the place we're all supposed to be going to as Christians. That is the kingdom of God in its fullness. But the kingdom of God also is active right here and right now. Because why? Because Jesus has come into the world. He's still here. can't see him touch him, but he's still here. And so we're hanging out with people, and God wants us to seek what's already going on, what he's doing. As I said in the first two sessions, it's not about doing his work. He hasn't called you to do a task. If you remember, he's called you to join him. If I'm going to go visit at the hospital and I ask Dwayne to join me, I'm not asking Dwayne to read devotions or to give communion or to bless the people in the hospital. I just want him to go along and to watch. And Dwayne will watch what I do, and at some point he may decide to do that on his own. Maybe he already does it on his own. This is not confession. And so we're seeking. And what you're seeking is a person in need. And I don't know about you, but I run into them every single day practically. Sometimes they come to me, but they're out there. Everywhere. Everybody sitting here this morning has a need. It may not be an earth moving need, but you have a need. And so when we hang out with people, get to know them, we seek what it is that's going on in their life that they have a need for. And then we recognize. We recognize that Jesus is at work doing what he does, and then we respond. The story he uses in the book is. He's having a party, or at a party in the neighborhood, in a driveway. Uh, it sounds like, uh, what do they call it, low country boil or something? Anyway, they're doing shrimp and something else. You know, eating, drinking beer, having a good time, not causing any trouble. And one of the gentlemen pulls him aside and starts to explain to the author uh, about his life and something that's going on at work. 
Well, A, he's already hanging out with these people, enjoying a good time of shrimp and beer and whatever else they're doing. And now he's kept his eyes open, and Jim has pulled him aside. That's the guy's name, I believe. And started to explain about what's going on in his life that he needs help with. He's distraught. So he recognizes the author that here's an opportunity to be an everyday missionary and to help Jim. So he let Jim pour out his story. And he looked at Jim and he says, Jim, have you sought God's counsel on this? Have you turned it over to the Lord? And Jim says, you know, I haven't. Thanks a lot. And they went back to doing what they were doing. And a few minutes later, his wife, the man's wife, comes to the author and says, I don't know what you said to my husband, but it's the best he's been feeling in weeks. All we have to do is respond. You don't even have to do a lot in some cases. Just point people to the obvious. Go to the Lord, pray, or pray with them maybe is something you would do sometimes. Key here is that you're hanging out with people a lot of times that you don't know real well, but you know from an occasional interaction. And we understand what the Bible tells us is we are supposed to love our neighbors. However, that love is not a technical love. Too many of us use the technical version of love. In our mind, we say, Oh, I love my neighbor. And in reality, we don't like our neighbor because of something they've said or done, something we know. When God tells you to love your neighbor, he means it. It's not a technical option. It doesn't fill the blank if you just say, okay, I love them, and then on the inside, really don't love them. And the question is, how do I love somebody that has hurt me or that I don't like for whatever reason? How do I love them? Well, the answer is simple. Again, it's the same way that Jesus loves you when you don't like God or when you don't like Jesus. It's called grace. God's grace. Grace stands for God's riches at Christ's reward. God's riches at Christ's expense, excuse me. There's no R on the end of grace. <laughs> Give me a break. I'm spelling in my head, standing up. So anyway, uh, God's riches at Christ's expense. That's the way God was able, uh, Christ is able to love you from the cross, even though you're a sinner and at times hate him, don't like him, deny him, which we all do because we're sinners. He does it out of God's grace. He embraces God's grace and he folds that person into the grace and therefore he loves them. And that's what God expects you to do. He doesn't want a technical love. He wants a real love. Get it only through the grace of God and through Christ. And so we're seeking what's already happening. It's not like you've got to go out and create some kind of event. It's already happening. You interact with the people you're around. You seek God's kingdom and what he's doing. You recognize what Jesus is doing, and you respond. Then you can go back and have the rest of your shrimp or whatever it is you're doing. But this is how... The theology plays out, and I'm going to read this because I don't want to miss any of these words. I should have printed it in the bulletin. I apologize. I'll print it later. But this is what the theology of how this all plays out looks. The kingdom of God, that is the redemptive presence and activity of God in human lives, has come into the world to work out the mission of God, the redeeming and restoring of human lives to the kingdom of God through the people of God. The redemptive presence and activity of God made tangible to other human beings. Three simple components of what's going on here in God's kingdom. And what we're asked to do is to seek out what's already happening, join Jesus as we do that, and respond. And so what does the kingdom of heaven look like here in this place? There are lots of examples in the New Testament. One that most of you, if not all of you, should be familiar with is Nicodemus. Nicodemus is the leader that came to Jesus and wanted to know what it took to be a Christian, to follow Christ, to be a man of God. And Jesus gives that wonderful answer, you need to, every man needs to be reborn. And Nicodemus, who's a teacher and a devout learner in the Word, understands the scriptures as they've been written at that point and told, looks at Jesus and says, how can a man go back into a woman's womb and be reborn again. And 
Jesus explains to him it's not literal birth, it's rebirth through the water and the word. Nicodemus is asking a question that lots of people are asking today. It's not a new question, it's not one that goes away. And all of the other examples are very similar. The Samaritan woman at the well, an enemy of the Jewish people, she's at the well by herself because she's an outcast, because she's been with so many men. And she's with a man right now that's not her husband. Jesus meets her at the well. He's there. And he offers her the living waters. And she's confused because he has no bucket. He has no, nothing to draw the water out with. Of course, he's thinking about himself and not the water in the well. And he begins to unveil those secrets that only she knew or the people in the town. He'd never met her before, but he reveals those secrets to her, and she's astonished. How do you know these things? He promises her forgiveness of sins and redemption, as he does to all of us, restoration, reconciliation with God. And she goes back and brings the rest of the village to hear what Jesus has to say. You could probably stop just about any person on any given day and talk to them. And if they were honest with you, many of them are suffering through similar situations in life. For whatever reason, they feel as outcasts in society. It's why our suicide rates are high, higher than they've ever been. It's why they're higher amongst military people coming back from deployments overseas. The number one reason they're giving is because they're coming back and no one listens to them. No one listens to them. I find them here in Barnesville. I find them every time I go through an airport or through a mall. And they want to tell their story. They just want somebody to listen. And that's what God has called you to do. It's what Jesus calls you to do as you follow him. As you join him on his mission is to listen and to recognize and to respond. It's not hard to do. The kingdom of God is active and here in this place right now. And there are lots of people that need to hear what you have to say, what we have to say as the church. So being a disciple of Christ means you have to do something. Jesus has already said, the game is on. and He wants you to be a part of it. You don't get to sit back and idly wait for your time to waste away. Jesus says, you need to get in the game, and you need to get in the game now. And he makes it, again, so simple. All you have to do is be yourself and share with people what you already know. That the God of the universe created all things from nothing, and that his Son, only Son, Jesus Christ, came into the world to live, suffer, died, and rose again for our sins, and now there is hope. There is redemption, there is reconciliation, there is restoration, and it has nothing to do with me or you or any other person. It's all about Christ. And as we said, Christ has already done the heavy lifting. All you need to do is come along. Come along and look. Come along and listen. And when you have the opportunity to respond. So I'm going to challenge you again. I'm going to pray that every morning you get up and the Lord will disrupt you, disturb you, excuse me, not disrupt you, that's a different thing, disturb you. And that he'll open your eyes and your hearts and you'll respond to what he puts before you in the opportunities you get. And I'm going to pray that you will focus on him and his uh, faith to you, the strength he gives you, the talents he gives you, and not on the things around you. Don't be distracted by the world. Be focused on Christ. And you need to be seeking what's already happening. And it starts from the moment you either get up in the morning or you leave here. It's all around you. It's simple. It's easy. It's biblical. And if you want to be a disciple of Christ, that's what it means. It means hanging out with people that you enjoy. Usually sinners. Well, always sinners because we're all sinners. Hanging out with people and enjoying them through the grace of God. Recognizing what Jesus is doing and responding. Jesus did it over and over and over in the New Testament. And he gave himself willingly so that every one of us, every human being, has the opportunity to be saved. And we have the privilege and the honor to join him on his mission. So you... 
whether you want to be or not, are an everyday missionary in your community, in your neighborhood, wherever you go. The church's prayer and my prayer is that you will let him disturb you, that you will, as we said a couple of weeks ago, take the bull by the horn and learn, excuse me, by the tail and learn something and rejoice in the life that God has given you because the daylight is waning, the night is coming. When Jesus comes back, it's all done. So, seek what's already happening around you. Recognize what God is doing, what Jesus is doing. Respond and enjoy the life that God has given you. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, guard your hearts and your minds through your faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.